true. God, we will fix our eyes on you. And we believe you're coming soon. Yes, we will fix our eyes on you. Your promises, they all come true. Oh, they all come true. Sing all praise. All praise. See the When you move, it's such an easy thing for you to do. And your head is moving right now. You were still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus. And your voice is calling me out. And right now, I know you're able. My can do all things you can do all things but fail cause you never lost a battle no you never lost a battle and I know I know you never will everything's possible God. 
There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another Hey, good morning, everybody. Good to see you this morning. Did anybody get did anybody get mask beard? I hate mask beard. It's the worst. I hate mask beard. You put the mask on and it folds your beard all weird. I just ugh, mask beard. I never knew that was a thing. Now it's a thing. Anyway, hey, welcome here. My name is Tim. So glad you'd be able to join us. If you're joining us online. Good morning to you as well. We're going to have a communion service today. So if you, those of you at home, if you want to get prepared for that, get a bread and some juice so you're ready for when we have communion later in the service, that would be fantastic. Also, those of you online, there's a special tab on our website called I'm New. And there's lots of information there. There's a connect card in there. There's other information you could find. We invite you to go to that alliancecommunity.ca. Um, for those of you in the room here, it's so good to see you. It's nice to be warm. It was minus 38 on my car this morning. And that was an honest minus 38. So I'm not sure what the wind chill did. Maybe minus 90,000. But it was awfully cold. Anyway, I have a few announcements for you. One is that we're having a worship and prayer night on February 19th at 7 p.m. So this will be our second one this year. And it was a fantastic on our first meeting we had. It was just uh, it was a great time to be together praying for families, praying for marriages and the church and the town and uh, worshiping God together. It was just excellent. So if you are able to come on that night, you can just sign up. Those of you online, you can sign up on, and um, uh, sign up at the website there and make sure that you are able to come to that. That'd be great. Also, next week, February 14th at 11 o'clock, 
we're having a baptism conversation class. So Jim will be leading that. Pastor Jim will be leading that. And uh, I don't know if you've been reading uh, in your, many of you have, reading in your Bibles through the New Testament. And uh, boy, the, the topic of baptism comes up quite a lot. And I hope it's been challenging you and moving in your heart. And if you are a believer and you have not been baptized, then I would strongly encourage you to come to this class next uh, Sunday at 11 o'clock. And then last, uh, we've been sending out some information on room to grow. And so the elders and myself have had a strong sense in our hearts that this is the direction God wants us to go. So hopefully you saw the video that I sent out last week. And I also sent out an email. And you should be getting a packet this week. And uh, I want you to prayerfully consider that and say, God, what is, your, what is the role you have for me to play? And already God is doing great things. And um, on February 24th, we're going to have a virtual town hall meeting. So it'll be a Zoom meeting on the 24th, and we invite you to come to that. You need to sign up uh, by sending an email to marlis at alliancecommunitychurch.ca and just say that you'd like to be a part of that. So those of you online, you're already set up for it. You're, you're in position now. And so you can um, uh, just plan to be a part of that. It's Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, virtual town hall meeting. All right, I want to invite the worship team to come up at this time. And uh, what a gift they are to our church. Uh, they were just rehearsing this morning. And as they were rehearsing, I was in my office and praying and just getting ready for the day. And uh, just felt them ministering to me already. And what a gift they are. So there they are just rehearsing. And already they're working because uh, God was ministering uh, his grace to me. Uh, one of the songs we're going to sing a little later on is All Who Are Thirsty, All Who Are We Come to the fountain, dip your heart in the streams of life. And then it says, come, Lord Jesus, come. Holy Spirit, come. And uh, that's what my heart needed to say this morning. So it was a real blessing. So uh, let's stand together, and then I'll open our time in prayer, and then we'll turn it over to the team. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your grace and your love for us. Thank you for welcoming us uh, by your spirit into your presence. That we can boldly come before the throne of grace to receive help and find mercy to help us in our time of need. And so we come with uh, joyful hearts. Um, may the warmth of your spirit flood our hearts on this cold, cold day. For those who are watching online, Lord, I pray that your spirit would minister to them in powerful ways as well that they would uh, be, um, know that we're one community together. Thank you that you are here, Lord Jesus, that you're with us wherever we are, that you are Emmanuel. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing.
unfailing love that never gives up, that never grows old. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And out of that faithful love, you pour peace upon us. Peace in times of suffering. Some are not here today. They're at home because of sickness. Lord, you pour peace on that in that season for them. Lord, you pour peace on us in the midst of turmoil in the midst of confusion and chaos. And we need you, Lord. We need to abide in you, to remain connected to you, to be attached to the vine. It is your will that we produce much fruit as we stay connected to you. And so I pray that that would happen, Lord Jesus, that we would stay close to you in your word and in prayer and connecting with you all the time, paying attention to you, being mindful of you. You are always mindful of us. And it's as we stay connected to you that then we can experience your power in at work through us, uh, in our families, and our homes, at school, at work, producing much fruit that's beautiful and pleasing to you, that's greatly satisfying to ourselves as well. Holy Spirit, we invite you to be here today. We invite you to guide us into all truth and bring glory to Jesus today, that our hearts might be drawn to him, to see him more clearly, the sacrifice he made. Lord, we have many examples, many models of that. And today we're going to speak about another one, another example of what it looks like to sacrifice for another. But Jesus, you were the perfect sacrifice. For that, we're so grateful that we can stand here today justified, holy, um, cleansed in your sight, not because of what we've done, but because of what you've done for us on the cross. Lord, these days there's lots of opportunity for tension, lots of opportunity to pick a side and, and fight on, and die on that hill. Lord, you call us to live in unity. 
Jesus, you pray just as the Father and you were one. So may we be one, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, in perfect unity. May we live in perfect unity. And this way the world will know that Jesus is who he said he was. You will know that Jesus came from the Father by our unity. Lord, help us be quick to forgive, quick to make generous allowances for each other because we love each other. Lord, we want to um, go to your word, hear from you, be challenged by you. Give us hearts that are open, minds that are willing to say, okay, okay, Jesus, I'll do whatever it is you're asking me to do for your glory, for our joy, for the hope of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. We're starting a new series this week called House Rules. And uh, with uh, February being the kind of a month that feels like a family kind of month. you got a family day vacation in there. you got Valentine's Day next weekend. Valentine's Day next weekend. That was a public service announcement. And um, so we, just, we like kind of leaning into family in February. And uh, so this is what this is about, house rules. And we're going to be looking at different things through the month. But uh, we're starting today. Uh, Jim and Teresa, Pastor Jim and his wife Teresa, are going to be speaking today. Uh, on marriage, and so uh, they are they are such a joy. They have they have an honest, faithful relationship. They have modeled this well, and you're going to hear lots of text today as they speak to you. But um, I want you to look for the subtext, the subtext of of um, um, mutual respect and uh, uh, submission and love for each other. So join me in welcoming Jim and Teresa. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Yeah, we're privileged to introduce this new series today. Uh, what a thrill it is. Uh, house rules uh, for better relationships, uh, particularly marriage or anything else. Uh, because when it comes down to relationships, all of us have this dream of love, sweet love, uh, like we see on the movies. My wife's watching too many Hallmark cuts. This little dig I'm getting into her right now. Uh, so, but the True. fact is, why is it so elusive? Why does it seem so difficult? Well, some kids age uh, four to eight were interviewed about what love is, and uh, this is what Carl, age five, says. Love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on cologne, and they go out and smell each other. Emily, eight, said, love is when you kiss all the time. Then when you get tired of kissing, you still want to be together and you talk more. My mommy and daddy are like that. They look gross when they kiss. Carl, age seven, or, pardon me, Karen, age seven, must be romantic. She says... When you love somebody, your eyelashes go up and down and little stars come out of you. <laughs> Tommy, who is a realist, says, if you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend that you hate. And then finally, love, love is like a little old woman, a little old man who are still friends even after they know each other. Well, we all have these uh, glorious ideals about what love is, uh, but invariably it seems like it's harder uh, than we think. Uh, and so divorce and domestic abuse, even in these COVID crazy days, is uh, uh, on the increase. And so it's uh, a thrill uh, for us to introduce this series on house rules to help us hopefully uh, learn how to relate to better. Because as you know, uh, family is foundational to society. And marriage, of course, is foundational to family and society as well. And so Pastor Tim, when we uh, uh, come up with a series, he asked if I'd uh, launch it. And he said, uh, I want you to speak about... Uh, house rules and involve suffering. Well, I thought I should invite Teresa in because we've done a lot of <laughs> suffering in our relationship. Maybe, maybe we'd have a, a little bit of an insight. And so I asked him and he said, sure. So, uh, so here we are, hopefully trying to share something about uh, love, uh, suffering, uh, and the challenge of uh, living together in unity and the suffering involved. Now, do the two really have anything in common at all, love and suffering? Well, what's the very first definition uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter of the Bible? What's the very first definition of love? Love suffers long. So in other words, anybody like to suffer? Uh, it's not really what we usually sign up for, but love involves suffering because really it is an act of the will. It's not what you see on Hollywood as well. And so today we just have the privilege of sharing some of our uh, 
experience and wisdom perhaps by God's grace uh, for if you're married or single or whatever as far as just relating better. Uh, so our love story actually starts in Peace River Bible Institute up in Sexsmith, uh, Alberta. Uh, I stumbled into the kingdom with a lot of hang-ups, uh, uh, hanging on to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. God has made us accepted in the beloved one, and of course we're having communion shortly. And uh, what a thrill that is. And I feel like I've been on that healing journey uh, ever since. And so uh, while I'm there, I meet this uh, beautiful, vivacious young lady. Uh, and uh, she's just uh, fun to be with. And yet, it seems like she's got some hang-ups too. And so uh, I just felt I should just hang out with her and hopefully help her uh, on the journey. And, uh, uh, of course, you can guess what happened in time. Uh, we had a unique, uh, actually, a unique subculture there. Uh, and that was we referred to one another uh, often as brothers or sisters in Christ. And so uh, I felt safe using that kind of terminology with her. And so I'd say to Teresa, I love you in the Lord, sister. That didn't go over real well with me, have to admit. I was interested in him. He was interested in me. And he was telling me, I love you, sister. But when I realized what was behind that statement, it was actually very endearing. Because he always felt that if he treated me as well as he treats his sister, who he treats with the highest regard, he, he's kind and gentle and tender with her. And I certainly saw that lived out in my own life. And I'm so thankful that he loves me uh, as he did the example being a sister. But I still didn't really like being told that because it didn't seem very romantic to me. But, of course, I like romance, mm -hmm. you know. Right. But our relationship definitely grew, obviously. And uh, we spent a lot of time together, growing together, finding out who we are and who we aren't. And also uh, learning a lot about God's love for us together. Well, August 12, 1978, we got married in Hythe, Alberta. Anybody heard of Hythe? Oh, a few people. There you go. Hythe is north of, west, west. I'm terrible with directions. I would tell you north because to me it's up there. But um, apparently it's west of Grand Prairie, about an hour. And actually I, I was from a farming community outside of Hythe yet, so I was raised on the farm, as was Jim. So if you're doing the math, we were married for almost 43 years in August this year. And uh, we've had a, a few good ones. I thought admit. we should have... I thought we should have the perfect marriage. We had great ideals. We had great models. We had great support. We had the Word of God. We had the manual for a marriage. And yet, it just seemed so difficult and so naughty and so uh, tough all the way uh, through. And looking back, uh, actually, I feel like we were stymied by the big three, money, sex, and power. Now, with money, basically, it seemed like there was just one uh, uh, issue with money, and that was we just never had enough. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Uh, we moved to Kitimat, B.C., uh, and actually with two promises. One was we could work all we could in the church there, which, of course, is where our heart was. And the other was we could work in your can, and I could work in the lumber mill there uh, because they were hiring Bible college students without looking at them because they had uh, such a good work ethic. And so the day I had an interview uh, with your can, I also had an interview at the church because the church had started a Christian school, and they were just overwhelmed with work and the, the load of it all. And so long story short, they hired the two of us together for 900 bucks a month, uh, which was probably like about a third of what I could have made with Eurocam, but uh, uh, that's where we were. Uh, and so uh, we did have this one big problem, and that was just, uh, uh, there was just too much month at the end of the money. I don't know if anybody can identify with that. You ever had that experience <laughs> uh, happen with you? Uh, I dare say if you could listen in on most of the uh, domestic issues happening in Silver Lake today, a lot of them would have as a root money finances. So first of all, money can be the big, the big clincher, and then sex. Never discovered my sexual abuse until we had been married for over 10 years. I was 31 years old. We should have had a clue that I, because I required so many surgeries in order to have children. But to top it all off, like most uh, couples, struggle with a husband who wanted more intimacy, sexual intimacy, and a wife who, well, not so much. The giant of childhood sexual abuse really was that in our marriage, and it almost killed us. And then there was power. Who's in charge here anyhow? Or are, uh, are we balancing power? When are you in charge? Uh, and it got so complicated. I mean, our spiritual gift mixes alone 
uh, which of course we didn't know at the time, are, are just very different. Uh, Teresa's a leader speaker, it turns out, and I'm a shepherd servant, and so you try to harmonize those two, especially in a culture, a Christian church culture, where uh, we uh, value male leadership uh, and men taking the lead. I remember nine and ten years in, uh, we actually moved to se- back to seminary. I had a dream about going over with the, overseas with the Alliance, and we had a really big difference because Teresa wanted to stay here, and we yeah, and so we just had, seemed like we had so many issues come up, and our personalities uh, were like polar opposites. Uh, we took the Myers-Briggs uh, course, and the counselor called us in and said, you guys still married? Probably not good counsel at that point, because <laughs> we'd been married for over 10 years. To be asked, are we still married, by a Christian counselor was not probably the best way to do it. But so how did we survive? How do we su- survive through those kinds of odds? I mean, we, had, we were polar opposites. We struggled, both uh, the, three, the three big ones. How did we make it through? Well, we really had to learn that our marriage was the trump card. We had to realize that, yes, God was the number one in our marriage. But we also had to give that the trump over each one of us. Jim had opinions. I had opinions. Was it all wrong? No. But we had to realize that we had to be intentional in creating a better us. Therefore, the house rules. But the first thing that we realized is we needed to make our next step a wise one. Every step we took We needed it to be wise. I know it wasn't perfect, and we didn't choose wisely all the time. But I remember in our first year of marriage, it was really early on, Jim looked at me, and he said, Babe, you know, if we make one wise step after another, we will look back one day and see how God has blessed us, how he, he has walked with us, He has kept us together, but also we are walking in blessing. And so here we are, almost 43 years later, and we're looking back and seeing how important those wise steps make a difference. If we keep on making those steps of faith, we will see what God can do in and through us. Proverbs 14 says, Chapter 14, verse 1 says, The wise woman builds her house. Key word being build. How can I build my home? How can I be intentional in building Jim, building our children, building every person that comes into our home and into our lives? But with her own hands, the foolish one tears hers down. That too is a choice. That, too, can make a difference. We could be looking back on unwise choices and living with many years of regret and fear and wondering where we went wrong. It says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 to not lean on our own understanding. We need to lean on his understanding. God knows. He sees around corners. He knows stuff. He knows all this stuff, and he loves us. And as we continue to give of ourselves, which is sacrifice, we have to lay ourselves down and give ourselves wholly to him and to one another. My motto for 2020 was beyond blessed. God often gives me a phrase or words that I carry with me. This year it's believe, but last year it was beyond blessed. When we look at our lives, I am beyond blessed to be married to this man. And I'm beyond, we're beyond blessed. Our children have married Christ followers. And they've given us 11 grandchildren. And they still like us. We are beyond blessed. Amen. And part of uh, that uh, changing your wisdom for God's wisdom, uh, 
as we read there in Proverbs, is being lifelong learners. Don't think you know it all, but, uh, and, and I was that way out of necessity because it seemed like I was just always banging my head against the wall in our relationship so often. <laughs> and so we made a point, even the very first couple of months into the marriage, we took, for example, the a seminar based at Youth Conflicts. And that was great because uh, one of the big things to take away there was to give up your expectations of each other so you can live free uh, and enjoy and be grateful uh, for what you've received. Uh, annually, we'd in, uh, do some kind of marriage retreat, and a lot of times we couldn't afford it, uh, but we might just read a book. That's all we uh, would do, uh, just something to build into your marriage. Uh, we've been getting this magazine for coming for almost 40 years uh, to our door, and it's been like a lifesaver. I've just devoured it because and focus on the family because it's always got some good advice for our relationship with Christ or with each other or kids. Uh, and uh, so there's just so many good resources out there, but we need to trade our own wisdom. Uh, sacrifice our own wisdom for the wisdom of God uh, and sacrifice even what we might uh, expect of our spouse. Uh, sometimes you think you know it all with your spouse uh, as well. Uh, one thing that's blessed me so much and blessed us so much is Teresa's relational intelligence. And I just had to be willing to, yes, what do you think about this, babe? I remember raising uh, teenagers and just feeling like writing them off. Uh, but Teresa said, no, we've got to do this and we've got to do this. And, uh, you know, if we do this, and so we'd beat out a compromise behind closed doors and uh, come with that uh, when it came to the kids. Another uh, piece of advice uh, was uh, don't go to bed angry. Uh, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Uh, deal with your issues. Uh, don't let them brood. Don't let them grow. I heard about a couple that was doing that once, and they stayed up for two weeks. <laughs> well, we never stayed up for two weeks, but we stayed up till two in the morning sometimes, especially that first year of marriage, uh, because we had this other great practice, and that was we made a point of praying together every night before we fell asleep. And usually I'd pray and uh, Teresa zonks off really quick and it might only be, you know, 60 seconds long or whatever. Uh, but we made a point of doing it. But I could never pray honestly to God Almighty if we had issues between us. And so we'd have to uh, try to work out our issues uh, and uh, uh, come to some agreement, come to some understanding. Uh, of course, making up was great fun. But then <laughs> to be able to go to sleep and at rest uh, with, with each other. So that was just really great advice uh, for us. So first of all, we need to make our next step a wise one. And secondly, we need to accept each other. That's really easy to say. It's quick to say. And we think, well, of course you do. It's a no-brainer. But opposites attract. I mean, Jim is tall and I'm not. That's outside. But he's an introvert. I'm an extrovert. I mean, that's no surprise to any of you who know me. But it's, it creates it creates like almost this this friction because we do not think the same. We do not process in the same way. I mean, when we were uh, young, I mean, of course, it attracted us to each other, but it wasn't long and it repelled us. It it came to the point where we just, why don't you think right? Get it together. What is the deal? But when those words are said, it breaks down communication. It, it breaks down that uh, confidence in even stating how we feel in, in situations. What's the solution? Is it, it creates a deeper love amongst us as we accept each other. So, Jim, is there anything that irritates you about me? Uh, sometimes you get a little wordy when you're stressed. <laughs> A little wordy. He's being really kind. It's lots wordy. And for me, with Jim, I mean, he, he takes a long time to process when he makes a decision. And he likes to check out all the options. And then once he's checked them all out, then he has to re, like, you know, go over them again and again and again. And I'm just like, all right, let's go. Let's get on with it already. It's painful. But learning how to accept and love and respect each other, even in our differences, because different is different. It's not wrong. And one thing that can just make the friction drop when you're trying to accept each other at a whole new level is to just be gracious in your speech with one another. Mm -hmm. uh, practice good etiquette. I mean, what is etiquette? Etiquette, uh, as someone has said, are the rules of the road that keep us from smashing into each other uh, on, on the journey of life. And Teresa regularly thanks me for taking out the trash or uh, emptying out the dishwasher. I think she probably hopes I'll maybe do it a little more. <laughs> well, attitude of gratitude is to me or us like the oil in a home. It, it just helps everybody to get along better. If we are grateful, I mean, Jim thanks me for doing his laundry. 
I love doing laundry, actually. It's true. And it's good he isn't allowed to because he's not good at it. But it, our clothes would look a lot different if we were counting on Jim. But does that mean it's wrong or, or bad? No. But if he thanks me, it just lifts me up. And it encourages me to keep doing good things in our marriage. So thirdly, the third house rule that is probably the foundation of what keeps us together and for a better us is daily feeding our souls on the Word of God. The Word of God is truly the only foundation that will not move. Mm -hmm. Everything in our world and in our lives, and especially in the last year, don't we all see and know and feel what it is to have such uncertainty? There's, we don't know from one day to the next. One day you can't play sports, and the next day they announce you can. So what are we going to do? Because we'd already decided we weren't. So all of those uncertainties in life, but the Word of God will never change. It will always remain. You know when you, have, when you put your back out, you feel really awful. You just, it slows you down, it's painful. I don't know about you, but it makes me grouchy, and I'm edgy then. But when I go to the chiropractor, and that chiropractor aligns it and puts it straight, all of a sudden I feel like I can take a whole breath again. And in the same way, every day, or nearly every day, when I spend time alone with God, it's like an alignment of my soul. It puts things in order. It puts things in perspective. And that's the thing about uh, having this relationship with Christ, really when it comes down to the bottom line, uh, he's the first person in our relationship. And mm -hmm. because we're into that soul alignment every day with him, uh, we've been so blessed. Otherwise, I, I really doubt if we'd ever be together today. But because he's number one, uh, that he's our savior. He's our yeah. saving grace as far as our marriage and, and not even just our sins only. Because really when you think about it, all of uh, your marriage issues and all of my marriage issues, probably most of your relationship issues can be traced back to one thing. I hate to sound too simplistic, but I really believe it just all gets back to one thing. And that one thing is pride. Hmm. And you just sacrifice your pride so that he can be number one. And it really is all about him. It's not about our pride, not about our selfishness, but it's all about following him and being who he's called us to be. And a lack of sacrifice in marriage, of course, will drive you apart. Now, you'd think with names like Mother Teresa and St. James, we should have this all nailed, uh, but we don't. Uh, matter of fact, I used to think I was a saint, and I got married, and now a saint I ain't, I know. Because <laughs> the fact of the matter is, I realized uh, how unsaintly I am. Because uh, as Gary Thomas says, he's got a great book uh, called Sacred Marriage. The subtitle is, What? If God designed marriage not so much to make you happy mm. as to make you holy. But if that's going to happen in your life, then it's going to be a crucible for you. It's going to be a grinding to make out you become like Christ. And so the invitation really is for the great pruning to fruitfulness. As Jesus talked about here in John chapter 15, uh, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And so the point of the matter is we're invited on this journey of being in, uh, having Christ be our soul aligner and knowing him. And I found so often I just felt like I was forced to Christ, uh, pressed into Christ even against my own will because there's so many issues coming up in our relationship. And I regularly would find myself praying, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? What do I need to learn? Uh, but it forced me into him and into his word and into the opportunity of having new fruit. Uh, as James says, and I remember memorizing James chapter 1, he says, uh, Dear brothers and sisters, is your life full of difficulties and trials? Then be joyful, because when the way is rough, your patience has a chance to grow, so let it grow, because when it's all over, what? 
You'll be strong in character. You'll be full and complete. And Jesus uh, says it another way in Matthew chapter 5, you're blessed when you're at the end of the rope. With less of you, there's more of God and his rule. And I remember being so angry and frustrated at times, I'd want to just put my fist right straight through the wall. And yet, I never really considered divorce an option. Why? Because I revered God too much. I couldn't imagine uh, telling God I'd broken the vows I'd made uh, to this lady. As Dallas Willard says, God is not mean, but he is dangerous. And making Jesus number one has been our foundation to being a better us because on our bad days, as you can appreciate, he's been our bouncer. He's got us together. Uh, he's number one, and we just need to humble ourselves before him. And on our good days, well, he's our joy, he's our life, and he's our all in all, even as we read uh, there in the text. One couple puts it this way. They say, in the covenant of marriage, God has two self-willed sinners to come together and become one flesh, not in body only, but in spirit in attitude, in communication, in love. Think about the implications. Imagine two self-willed sinners trying to submit to one another as God calls them to. That'll take a decade. Or imagine two self-willed sinners trying to serve one another joyfully. Another decade. Or to try to show honor to one another. Or to encourage one another, edify one another. It's a lifetime challenge, perhaps the greatest challenge there is. Don't misunderstand us. Marriage can be wonderful. It can be deeply satisfying and mutually fulfilling. But if it becomes that way, it's because both partners have paid a very high price over many years that, to make it that way. Because we only conquer where we surrender. It's all about laying down ourselves for the sake of another, the perfect example in Jesus Christ. We really do belong to an upside-down kingdom. It isn't the way it is in the world. We do find hope in Christ alone. The beautiful uh, picture that is painted for us is in Ephesians as husbands and wives. Now, sometimes we want to avoid this, these verses because we feel like, I don't want to do what it says. But can I relieve you of that pressure today? Bring us back to the verse bef before it talks about wives. It says, submit to one another. Why? Out of reverence for Christ. Do I want to live my life for Jesus? Do I want him to be seen in and through me? Then in that way, we will submit ourselves one to another. And then it talks about the setting is there for husbands and wives. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord. Now that word sometimes is not very welcome to us as ladies. Because when we think of submission, maybe we think of doormat. Or we think of we don't have any rights. We don't have any, we can't say anything. None of those things are true. In fact, if there's abuse, you need to run. You need to find somebody to help you. But if, if it's in a, a marriage relationship where we are growing together and working together, there is nothing more beautiful than submission, than, be, than submitting ourselves to each other out of reverence for Christ. So when we as women need to talk to our husbands... We need to tell them where we're at. We need to be open in that way. I don't assume that Jim knows what I need. I don't assume that he understands what I'm going through. I tell him, and I know I'm an extrovert, and it's easier for me maybe. But work at it. Figure it out. Figure out a way to be able to communicate clearly with each other. They want to know how to be a better husband or in other relationships as well. So submit to your husband out of reverence for the Lord. Again, it's that, as to the Lord, it's that same uh, message to us. It's all about him. But what does, I always think my job is big. My responsibility before God is huge. Because submission is yielding to another or being devoted. Now that to me is a beautiful picture and a great opportunity for me as a woman to be devoted to. But then, when I look at Jim's responsibilities, his is way, it's impossible. It's an impossible ideal. 
Mine's challenging, but his is impossible. Because it says, husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's impossible. And yet, as a woman, I have no problem being in submission or being devoted to a man who loves me like Christ loves the church. And so I guess to summarize it all, basically, if anything good comes out of a relationship or any fruit, as Jesus talked about there, to the glory of God, it's because uh, we've used this suffering, used these trials to help make us more like Christ because uh, you don't want to waste your sorrows, do you? Uh, I mean, and then Paul says, uh, the sufferings of this present life aren't worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to come. Uh, these light and momentary afflictions work for us uh, an eternal and uh, ongoing weight of glory. And so don't waste your sufferings, but let them be a chance for us to be pushed to Christ and uh, surrender to Him in new ways. Because whether we like to admit it or not, suffering is part and parcel of the human race. You and I live in a fallen world. Our world's been twisted and perverted by sins and, and sin, and so have we. And suffering is going to be the way that we come to experience Christ's likeness because it's part and parcel. Uh, I love what Robin Reimer, uh, Rob Reimer says. It, it's not a question about if you're going to suffer. It's how will you suffer? Will you use your suffering redemptively? And we have the privilege of, because we know Christ, of having redemptive suffering, using that suffering to make us more like Christ, to grind up the selfishness, pride in our lives, and to sacrifice that, that uh, Christ might be smelt and seen and lived out by us. I so appreciate working with Pastor Tim and uh, Jennifer. And one of the things I especially love about them is that they've gone through substantial suffering, mm. and they've chosen to respond to it redemptively. And that's really the invitation for each one of us. Whatever suffering, whatever issue we're in, let it use, uh, be a chance for us uh, to experience more of Christ's grace, even the hard times we're having in COVID, because love suffers long. I mean, as you, as you sum it up, really, to me, it seems like it's just two words uh, kind of sum it up really well. It's persevere graciously for a better us to the glory of God. I mean, if you have made vows, persevere graciously hmm. in keeping them. Uh, to the glory of God and for your own well-being. Or if you're single again, persevere graciously in sexual purity for a preferred future. Or if you're uh, practicing shared parenting, uh, practice persevering graciously uh, for the well-being of your kids uh, down the road that they can prosper and do as good as possible. Whatever difficult situation you and I are in, uh, the, the invitation is we can learn and grow to be like Christ, all to the glory of God. And it's remarkable to think that your little life and mine, when we think about the transcendent glory of God, uh, he'll be honored by that. Uh, and our little marriage, he'll be honored by that. Uh, and whatever life situation we find ourselves in. It's not about you, and it's not about me. That is the bottom line. It's all to the glory of God. It's to bring honor and glory to Him. Whatever we go through, whatever struggles we face, whatever losses we embrace, whatever joys we experience, it's all to the glory of God. He is number one. His plan, his design is so much bigger than ours. He sees often, as Jim always says it, he sees the big picture on the wide screen. But all we need to do is focus on him because he sees, he knows. It's all about him and there will be a better us. There will be better families. There will be better relationships. There will be better marriages. All to the glory of of God. Amen, sister. <laughs> well, let's pray on that note. <laughs> Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you that you are here. Thank you for your patience, for your kindness, for your gentleness for prompting us and sometimes even pushing us to a better us. So, Father, today we just, we just bring to you our hearts. We ask you to speak to us. 
we ask you, Lord, as we sit quietly before you, that you will reveal to us what relationships we're in that we have made ourselves number one where we have pushed ourselves to the forefront when it's just to be all about you. Lord, forgive us for when we have taken your glory. So what relationship is Jesus speaking to you about today? Is he number one in your marriage, in your friendships? Is there hurt and angst in the midst? Is he calling you to be holy, to suffer for his glory? Jesus, we ask that you will heal our hearts, heal our homes, heal our hurts. Give us persevering hearts, persevering grace to walk through what we're in, knowing that you are there. There is nothing we face, there's nothing we're in that you aren't there. Help us, Father, to lean into you, to find ourselves holy in Jesus, knowing that when you gave your life, you gave it for this one too, and this one, and whatever you're facing today. Lord, help us to release it into your presence where you can make sense of it. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and enter into a time of worship, and uh, let's prepare for communion as well. Let's stand together.
Jesus has come. He said, I have come. I have come to bring good news. I've come to heal the brokenhearted. I've come to bring comfort to those who mourn. I've come to set prisoners free. Release for captives. Maybe you feel that way in your relationships that you're in right now. There's mourning. There's sorrow. There's captivity. There's uh, a, a darkness. And Jesus has come to bring that to you, to bring life to you. If we will come to him. He offers himself in that situation. He doesn't just offer... Uh, you know, warm words of encouragement. He offers himself. And when he offered himself uh, on the cross that night, uh, you know, when Jesus celebrated the Last Supper, uh, he did this in, in context. Jesus knew that his time was very near. He knew this. He knew that Judas had sold him out. He knew that the Pharisees were trying to kill him. He knew all this. There was lots of chaos the walls were closing in around him, but in the midst of that, he paused to celebrate the supper with his disciples. Maybe you feel that way. Maybe you feel that your, the sides are closing in around you. You're giving in to despair. There's chaos. You're feeling hopeless. You know, Jesus offers hope to you. He offers it by taking care of the biggest obstacle there is, which is death. That's what we're most afraid of death in relationship, death in our bodies, death in our dreams. Jesus conquered that on the cross. He rose again. And he did that with the sacrifice of his life. And he sets us free from hell. He takes it on his shoulders. He makes a way through. So when we partake of this supper, this meal, this symbol of, of our Christ's sacrifice, we do so with thankful hearts. This is what Jesus said. In the midst of all the craziness of what he's going through, he said, while they're eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so that's what we do. We partake together. And so our team are going to lead us in a closing song, but as they do that, let us uh, let me pray and then we'll partake together. Lord, thank you so much for what you did for us on the cross. I thank you for the life that you provided for us. Eternal life can be found in you and only you. And we look for this in all kinds of places. We will always be disappointed until we find it in you. You were big enough uh, to deal with all the problems of our lives by dying for us on the cross. Now, you took the curse on yourself, the curse that we deserve to carry. You took that on yourself by becoming a curse for us. And by rising from the dead, you put away the curse so that there is no more curse. We live under grace now. We have the blessing of Abraham in our lives. We live in the promises. We have the inheritance because of you, Jesus. And so we remember you and we celebrate you and we give thanks for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together. We are grateful for your kindness. Let's stand now and declare this in song. Declare the story once again that we have been set free because of what Jesus did for us on the cross.
love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began ash was redeemed only beauty remains my orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet my feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began oh your grace so free washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your beloved ones that's our life and may that warm your souls as you go out to a cold day allow me to close receive a final blessing here to Christ who constantly loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father to him be glory and power forever and ever amen God bless you on your way pastor Tim is going to come and give us words of dismissal Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. If there's any in the, in the fellowship hall, we'll let them head out first. 
And uh, on the outside two aisles here, you guys are welcome to go on my left and your right. And then also these two aisles over here, these two rows are, can, are free to go as well. Middle section, you got to hang in there for a little bit longer. I know, right? You guys got toys though, so you're good. If you'd like to pray, Jim's up here, Teresa's up here. I'm sure they'd love to be able to pray with you guys. I would be up here as well. I'd love to be able to pray with you today. center section here. You guys are free to go as well. God bless you. Have a great week. <laughs>